Hey guys, welcome to Brain Electric. When will Neuralink be available to healthy individuals? This question has been on our minds since the launch event in 2019. It's been on our minds since the Wait But Why article. The question of an implantable consumer device has been around since BrainGate and earlier. Can you envision a day when um, healthy patients have implants of this sort? And I always found it interesting how it seems like in every interview, presentation, keynote, Q&A, this question is just never asked flat out to someone who works at the company. The closest thing to an official answer is actually posted on Neuralink's website. Interesting that it's at least addressed, kind of. Still worded somewhat ambiguously here. Or at least it just doesn't give us a clear picture of what to think on this topic specifically. People say, oh, it'll be 20 years, 50 years, 500 years, never. Some people said never. I said, what are you, why are you a neuroscientist? <laughs> Until recently, Siobhan Zillis, project director at Neuralink, gave a presentation at the Canadian Undergraduate Conference of AI titled The Future of Brain Machine Interfaces. And the Q&A starts, and I'm assuming it's gonna be the same questions people have been asking again and again for the past couple years. But suddenly, boom, it was just perfect. First question asked. Someone finally asked Siobhan, who's a key member at the company and just super interesting to listen to in general. I'd highly recommend watching this presentation here, but here's her answer. You're, you're probably looking at 12 to 15 years. I have a sneaking hypothesis that some of the, the deeper brain implants will be desired by relatively healthy pe people on a shorter time scale. Um, but again, on the earliest, you're looking at seven to 10 years plus whatever additional regulatory cycle is required to make it just like universally available. But I think the existence proof will exist in seven to 10 years. 12 to 15, seven to 10. So here we are, now it's July, 2021. Seven years from now is July 2028. So first of all, let's just grant the fact that 10 years is not that long of a time. I mean, 10 years ago is 2011. Has that much happened? Kind of. But the perception of this being a long time, like devices that were prototypes in 1960 and then were available to the public in 1970, it's like things just get buried in time, you know? It's already been two years since the launch event, and even that seems like it's gone by so fast. So again, from our first person perspectives, when somebody says, yeah, maybe 10 to 20 years, it's like, okay, well, talk to you then, I guess. But what are we talking about here with this device specifically? Why 10 years? Why seven years? Why did Siobhan say that? Wow, that's, that's pretty soon, honestly, in the grand scheme of things. If you guys are following Neuralink, you'll probably have heard that clinical trials are starting soon, or at least have been announced. We saw this job posting, recently. And then in Siobhan's presentation from a few months ago, she says clinical trials are starting six months from, from then. So first of all, what are clinical trials? What's going on here? If you build a medical device, it has to be approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, in order to be manufactured and sold. Max Hodak, former Neuralink president, mentioned in the launch event that they were working with the FDA's guidelines. And again, in the summer update, Elon mentions they're working with the FDA and that they received a, quote, breakthrough device designation. So we've heard the FDA mentioned a couple times, kind of in passing, but still mentioned. So the interesting thing about framing the conversation in the context of the FDA is that once you start going down an FDA rabbit hole, this entire medical device industry opens up, one that's been around for decades, you know? and one that every single medical device must pass through in the US. So suddenly for me, this abstract, ambiguous timeline conversation that started around the time of the launch was suddenly brought down to earth in this fascinating way. Because unless you work in or around the field, you might not be aware that Neuralink's device and their robot in the context of the FDA is just another medical device trying to get FDA approval. It's not like some mysterious other thing that's making its own rules in a black box and therefore those rules can never be known. They gotta go through the good old FDA. And now where there was a lack of answers regarding Neuralink specifically, there is so much information regarding medical device approval. So let's dive into that. So the FDA classifies medical devices into three classes. Class one device, least amount of risk to the user, least amount of control. Class two device, x-ray systems, physiological monitors. Class three devices support or sustain human life or may not well be tested like heart valves, etc. So at Neuralink, you've got two main devices. You've got the robot and you've got the chip. And both of those, as I'm sure you can guess, are class three devices. But as soon as I started reading about class three devices, suddenly the question was like, what other implantable class three devices already exist? Well, let me tell you, there are many. Pacemakers, cochlear implants, artificial hips, artificial discs, intrauterine devices, 
metal screws, pins, plates, rods, artificial knees, coronary stents, ear tubes, artificial eye lenses for cataracts, prosthetics replacing body parts, breast implants. The things I circle back to were, okay, so A, this is obviously already definitely a thing, and B, what is a way of describing something that people would get as an aesthetic thing or like something voluntary like breast augmentation or LASIK, a device that involves a procedure people just get because they want to look better, feel better. Well, the FDA actually has a term for that. It's called the implant applications, and there are six of them. First, we got sensory and neurological, used for disorders. Then we've got cardiovascular, used for disorders. Orthopedic, to alleviate pain and issues. Electric, relieve pain and suffering. Number five, contraception, prevent unintended pregnancies and treat certain conditions. And number six, cosmetic slash prosthetic, like aesthetics correction. So number six is what we're talking about, right? That would be the case with Neuralink. But it's tricky because obviously we're talking about neurosurgery. These other medical devices are clearly treating serious disorders. So what's the term that describes a surgical procedure that you simply choose to do? You don't need it, but you just want it. Again, what is that called? The term is elective procedure. And this is why I think Elon has mentioned LASIK several times. It's the most popular elective procedure. It's cosmetic surgery dealing with a major organ. It augments the function of these organs, your eyes. It involves a large device, one that needed to be cleared by the FDA. Because yeah, we've heard him mention LASIK in interviews and presentations, and you think, oh, well, he's mentioning LASIK because he says it was something that was able to scale because they developed a laser, you wouldn't want a surgeon doing it by hand, etc. But interestingly, the crossovers seem to go much deeper than that. And I'm sure, of course, that's really why he's mentioning it. It's because it really is like the most similar device in terms of its FDA approval process. And now it's commonplace in society as a popular elective, non-trivial, but aesthetic, cosmetic, surgical procedure. So back to the thing regarding the timeline. If you look at the FDA approval process for LASIK, what analogies can we draw? How did LASIK go from animal testing to becoming the thing that I got done, that many of us have gotten done? In the launch event video, we heard about animal testing at UCSD. In the progress update video, we saw the animal testing they've done with pigs. And in the recent Mind Pong video, we see Pager using the device to play Pong. Here's a picture of similar animal testing that occurred with LASIK's early trials. But this brought me back to the question, okay, well, how did LASIK transition from animal testing to human trials to elective procedure? Neuralink has done their animal testing, and now they're moving to human trial. With the history of LASIK, Back to zooming out on the timeline, there are years and decades that just kind of get lost in history. There were human trials in the 80s, and then this article says in 95 after a, quote, three-year successful trial. So even after scouring the internet, it's difficult to draw the trial period to elective procedure as a straight line. This seemed odd, though, since, yes, there could be all these disparate parts and labs and universities and hospitals, so maybe something happened over here, and then this led to that, and then 20 years go by, and then if you're born in the 90s, by the time you even think about getting the surgery, it's 2018, and this stuff has been around for 30 years, you know? But I was convinced there has to be some kind of FDA approval that makes this timeline less scattered, you know? Let's look back at the actual device in question, the laser. So I posted this question on the R Medical subreddit to try to get answers regarding LASIK that would hopefully shine light on what's going on with Neuralink. So there were two answers, both had interesting implications. So we know that there are three classes of medical devices, but what is the term that describes how they get approved? Well, this guy had an answer for me, pre-market approval. That's what we're looking for, PMA. On the FDA site, they've got lists of medical devices and their PMA information. There's a whole list of these devices. They're, they're being submitted and accepted every year, all the time. Here's a look at LASIK's PMA from 2000. It was submitted December 19th of 2000. It was accepted in September 28, 2001, nine months. Here's the approval statement. It says, so notice how specific the conditions are. With Neuralink, we'll see an approval statement for the robot and an approval statement for the chip. It'll outline what the device is for, who it's for, etc. Okay, so now what does the pre-market approval process for class three medical devices involve? There are normally four phases of clinical trials. Phase one usually lasts a few months, involves a small group of people. Phase two could be months to years, involving a larger group. Phase three could be years, involves an even larger group. So here's where things get interesting and recent and past sound bites from Neuralink employees start to come into play. 
we are working as hard as we can towards our first inhuman clinical study next year. Our first clinical trial is aimed at uh, people with paraplegia or, or tetraplegia. For the first investigational device exemption, so that's the IVE that we're working toward right now for those first um, clinical trial patients, we are um, guaranteeing like one year. We're hoping to start that human trial as soon as possible and we're working really hard to get to a trial where we'll be able to invite uh, or, or hope to gain the participation of about 10 people to look at mostly the safety uh, of this device, which we think will not be um, any, any more risky than all the other technologies I talked about that have been around for many years. We've seen that clinical trials start soon, but it's not just clinical trials, right? It's phase one of clinical trials. In this recent presentation given by three Neuralink employees at Everything ALS, we get a sense of who specifically will be involved in the trial starting shortly. They said that they have monthly meetings with a focus group, and I'm assuming patients from or associated with that group will be the first patients involved in phase one. BrainGate enters the chat. BrainGate researcher Lee Hochberg mentioned here that they're working with and advising Neuralink. Why? Because BrainGate has already been through three phases of clinical trials. What we're learning in our BrainGate research I, I want them to know. They've been planning brain-computer interfaces in humans since 2004. It's been 17 years. So back to that thing of decades being lost in time. Those decades, it seems, with regards to brain-computer interfaces, have, in a way, already happened. Serious research started in the 90s into the 2000s, and Neuralink was founded in 2016. So now we have a better sense of what these timelines are actually referring to, like why Siobhan said seven years because phase one will take us closer to 2022. Phase two could be 2022 to 2023. Phase three could be 2023 to 2028. But interestingly, in this soundbite, Elon says five years. How many years? If the development continues to accelerate, then maybe like five years. Five years from now is July 2026, which is only two years shy of 2028, obviously. But now, why would he say that? Uh, maybe because he's always throwing out ambitious timelines or because he knows what the FDA knows. Remember, hundreds and hundreds of devices are going through the pre-market approval process right now, just like Neuralink. So again, we're not in some mysterious what will happen. The approval process is granted because of the information presented to the FDA in the PMA documentation that is then turned in and reviewed during each phase of clinical trials. A lot of the approval process is based on the presentation and the context of the data. Plus, you've got certain classifications that expedite the approval process, like a device can receive a de novo classification or an HDE. This Reddit user pointed out that with, say, COVID, medical devices, and obviously the vaccine, the PMA approval path was flexible. In general, it's not a fixed thing. These things made it through the system in months. Obviously, we all know why, but it underscores the importance of the documentation the importance of the language used, the evidence, the narrative. That's going to be a PMA. I mean, I can tell you, even not knowing what the technology is or what the, what the, what the cancer is, I can tell you that that's what it's going to be. On the other hand, if you want to say that this is a tool that's used as an adjunct and provides information that the clinician can use, and so, you know, softer language, then a lot of times you can get those products through, through the 510K pathway or potentially maybe the de novo pathway. And so... Uh, it's very important to work with somebody who understands um, the regulatory implications of indications early on because it's amazing how much difference uh, the pathway can be. Now, I've always wondered, why is there almost never a mention of when the implant will be available to the general public? Max said in the launch event, the company is laser focused on their first patients. Siobhan mentioned here that... Like Neuralink, we think in months and people are like, oh, what's six months out? And we're like, it's two weeks. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes sense. But in general, the company constantly emphasizes that this device will be used to treat disorders. The documentary I Am Human did an amazing job at demonstrating how profoundly important this topic is. But since we're on this FDA train of thought, and we've established that language and context and narrative is so important with things being expedited through the PMA process, it makes perfect sense how the company narrative is putting treatment of disorders first and foremost, and the premise of augmentation for the general public and merging with AGI as either not mentioned at all or kind of glossed over. All the way to the ultimate goal of you know, helping save humanity from the existential threat of a ambiguous future with where there's general AI. This most likely has a lot to do with the way in which the FDA perceives the company's mission and therefore the way in which it might potentially grant expedited approval to them. Not that we wouldn't want the clinical trials to be as stringent as they possibly could be, 
they will be regardless of anything. But keep in mind, we have so much clinical trial data from BrainGate that will undoubtedly be useful. Again, this is certainly not the first time a human is receiving a brain-computer interface. It just seems as if the step from phase one and phase two of the trial will go very quickly. Trials with N1 start in three months, and then phase one is submitted for review, and then we start phase two. Due to the fact that we have so much clinical data on BCI patients, I mean, things could change. So much of the heavy lifting has already been done, and that if there were issues that arose during animal trials, things wouldn't be moving so quickly into human trials. And then if there were things that went profoundly wrong during 17 years of brain gate trials, it just seems like the patients will get N1. We'll see interesting videos start to surface of patients interacting with their devices. And we in fact have already seen this footage of patients controlling their devices. And just getting to see that first video of someone who can simply go home and live with the device, it'll be so fascinating to keep tabs on. That goes without saying. But then phase two will move into phase three. Now back to the initial question. Here's a soundbite from Matt McDougall. Our design philosophy is that this should be safe enough that it can be an elective procedure. Here's a quote from Max Hodak on he himself wanting a neural interface. Here's a quote from Ian, head of robotics. If we make this so automated and safe and fast that like anyone can get it, even the idea of really fast keyboard and mouse for myself that I don't need to use my hands for is like super alluring. My question is this. We have somewhat analogous medical devices. We have somewhat analogous historical data with regards to other clinical trials and approval processes. But something I couldn't really find a clear answer on is that transitional period from clinical trials to elective procedure. With LASIK, there are so many other miscellaneous trials that occurred in the 80s and 90s, so it's still unclear when you could go to a facility and just pay and get it done. And remember, LASIK's clinical trials were done in the same way essentially that Neuralinks are being done, addressing disorders and diseases. So, will a healthy individual get the surgery during phase three of the first set of Neuralink's clinical trials? Or will there be a second trial period in which a group of non-disabled humans get an N1 or an N2 or an N3 implant? And then the three phases of clinical trials repeats until there is enough data to approve the device for mass production. Here's an interesting quote from the FDA's site with regards to LASIK. The FDA does not have the authority to regulate a doctor's practice. Hmm. It makes you wonder what the company is scheming on, for lack of a better phrase. There must be some level of conversation addressing phase three or trial two. Although with the size of the company and based on what both Siobhan and Max have said, it could be entirely possible that they're just head down one step at a time. Will the first three phases of the first clinical trial period secure pre-market approval for the robot to be mass produced? Will trial one take us to a development of office spaces where the surgeries are conducted, like with LASIK? Who will be the first non-disabled person to get the surgery? And again, will this take place in trial one or a second trial? So just to put everything into context, the framing of the clinical trial phases, the clinical trials in general, and the pre-market approval idiosyncrasies leading to expedition are super interesting. And of course, during these upcoming years, you'll have more people joining the company. I mean, right now we're talking about controlling a mobile device like an iPhone. I don't think in 15 years we'll still be using iPhones, do you? Not to mention the way in which the developments at OpenAI with the upcoming rollout of GPT-4 and then eventually GPT-5 and so on. If that technology is to impact every industry, why wouldn't it impact Neuralink? I mean, they literally share an office space in San Francisco. But what can be done in the meantime? What can be done this year? It feels like recently we've seen a lot of non-invasive companies coming out with products, but the direction they seem to be going in is the collection of attention data, giving us notifications when we're focused, when we're not focused. But maybe there's more that can be done in the non-invasive space to interact with our devices, to anticipate the public availability of N1 on some level. A question to linger on in the next episode. Thank you for watching, and of course, leave your thoughts down in the comments.